Okay, we've gone through a lot of technical jargon lately to understand the mechanics of the uh, program itself and how it operates as it kind of moves through the pipeline. Uh, now we're going to start getting into the common tools used within Nuke, and the most common one you will ever use inside of Nuke is your Roto tool. It recalls me back to when I spoke to a friend of mine who was the VFX supervisor on Jupiter Ascending. Um, he told me that, you know... I was asking him as a teacher, what do you want to see in people's reels for compositing? Um, and he said, you know, your, your school's great. The kids are doing good. They, they've got a lot of really cool 3D elements incorporated with CG. But he said, I honestly, I spent the last five or six years of my career in compositing uh, in 2D land, not 3D land. And what he meant by that was a lot of cleanup work, a lot of color correction work, a lot of rotoing, uh, stuff like that. And that, in essence, is a lot of what compositing is. Um, and it's just merging together all the elements. And he said he hadn't gotten into 3D until, again, five or six years later. So a lot of what rotoing is, you might be familiar with it as a filmmaker if you used DaVinci Resolve and you used uh, qualifiers and so forth. It's very similar in that respect, using masks and After Effects and so forth in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and jump in. I've got my file loaded up again. Again, shot one Sony A6300 face exposure. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and use a roto here. So there's two types of rotos. There's the roto, and then the new and improved roto paint. This was invented around the time of Avatar for the sake of doing specific uh, paint job work and so forth. It's using a lot of cosmetic beauty work, and it's very handy for cleaning up wrinkles and so forth and all that. And it does a lot of work as far as uh, set extension work, clean plating, um, that kind of thing. So let's just talk about, you know, what is this? How, how does this thing work? Well, let's just start with the roto node for, for, uh, for starters. It's important to notice the roto node has these, when you double click it, you get through these three icons here. Okay, if I hit the roto paint node, you can see we got an additional nodes here. So the first nodes on the roto here is select all, select spline, select points, select feather points. Over here you have add point, remove point, cusp point, smooth point, open, close, curve, remove feather. And the last you have bezier, cusp bezier, B spline, ellipse, rectangle, cusp rectangle, and open spline. Um, whereas if we see the roto paint node, it's basically the same thing, but with more stuff. Um, but you have the, the addition of some paint work. So you have brush erase, you have your typical clone reveal, we'll get into those, blur, sharpen, smear, and dodge and burn. So let's go ahead and just talk about how these things are all different, used. Usually they're used to, for instance, cut a person out of the uh, actual background. Um, working on the commercial for uh, Capital One, I had to take Samuel Jackson's shoes, which were highly reflective and couldn't be keyed very well. And we had to roto individually animate around his feet as uh, his shoes, to be precise, as he was walking on a green screen set. And it was a painful, but was part of the process of learning and, and getting into understanding the precision that you have to do when it comes to rotoing. So typically, in a roto, you don't have to necessarily be connected to the roto with the viewer to actually use it. Okay, so it's important to know that. So I can actually have my viewer hooked to the to uh, myself here and actually just start working as long as my roto node is in my properties bin. Again, I set my properties bin usually to one just for the sake of uh, not going crazy. And let's go ahead and draw out a roto. So here is a bezier, and I'll go ahead and just draw one out and close it up. Now it's important to know how I drew that. Over here you can see this plus and minus button. I'm going to go ahead and hit minus and get rid of that bezier and I'm going to redraw it again. If I just click and click and click and click and click I get cusped edges. Okay, You can see they're very sharp like so and they're not very smooth. Um, this is not used that often inside of compositing unless it's a hard surface uh, roto you're doing. For organic rotoing, for instance, on a character, you want to have actual smooth uh, points with tangents on them, or handles, or uh, curves and so forth. So you can right-click and hit Smooth, or you can bring it back to Cusp. So you can see, oops, let me go ahead and do that again here. Right-click, and then I will say Cusp. There are hotkeys on here which are cool, which is Shift-Z and Z. So I can come in here and hit Z or Shift Z and go back and forth. Oops, hit tab there. Now, uh, if you want to insert a point, you can come over here and say Add Point. Add a point at any one time. 
You can uh, come in here and add a cusp point if you want, or a smooth point. So if you want to come in here and click individual points and add that information. So if you wanted to go back and cusp it, which is sharpen it back to a point. You can see I could use cusp, and I'll cusp these guys. There we go. All right, I could smooth it again by clicking smooth. There's open close curve, so you can actually click and it'll open close it. It's not going to open close it where you want. It's going to close it where you actually uh, opened it. So you can see I close it and open it here. doesn't matter where I choose this. It's going to go ahead and do it. So sometimes you want it open, sometimes you don't. Um, <clears throat> with that, you also have this option here for remove feather. Now, in order to feather this, I'm going to go ahead and come over here to select all. I have a point selected here. And I can go ahead and hold down control drag it out and I have a feather. Now how do I know this is feathered? Well, I currently have my viewer set to myself. I'm going to put my viewer to the roto node and hit A for alpha. And you can see I have this nice feathering here of information. Now if I don't want to see any of these red lines, I can always hit the letter Q and that's going to hide the overlays. So putting your viewer or your cursor over the viewer here and hitting Q will actually help you hide it and grow it and you can see it very well. I could also add a couple a little feather in here, which will feather it out. And there's also feather fall off, which can determine the logarithmic fall off of that kind of fall off uh, feathering, you can see. Kind of changes up the, the, uh, the sides. There you go. So <clears throat> this, I'm looking at the alpha, by the way. I just want to mention that. If I look to what the output of the roto is, I could either output alpha, or I can output RGB, or I can output RGBA. Now, if I output alpha, you can see if I'm looking in RGB, right, I don't see anything. But if I hit the letter A to go to my alpha channel, you can see that it's outputting alpha, alpha information. Now, if I put this to uh, output RGBA, you can see I'm in my A alpha and it's outputting alpha. And if I click A to go back to RGB, we're also outputting a color information, red, green, blue. Very, very important. Now, you do have the choice here. You can see you can change the color of this Bezier by double clicking and we can make it green or whatever we want. And then if I hit A for alpha, you can see we still have A alpha information in there. Again, if you double click here, you can see what we're outputting here you could see that we're outputting 100% alpha information. And then this is our red, green, blue information, right? RGB values. So with that, we're getting an opaque alpha and we're getting color information in the red, green, blue. So again, I'm gonna hit Q for overlay. Every time you have a problem, look up here for any red. That means something's up. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Q. I get my overlays back and now I can move them around. These can be animated. You can see the minute you lay down an, uh, any roto, you get a keyframe here in blue. If I drag it over here and animate, you can see that we get animation, which is really cool. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take this Bezier and erase one, erase it again. You'll also notice we have folders in here. These come in handy um, if you want. You can create multiple folders here. And sometimes you can put transform information in each folder. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave this as root, this root folder here. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw a couple more rotos just to show you some of the other options you have. Now again, the Bezier determines whether or not you click and drag out. So if I click on my left mouse button and drag it out, I get a Bezier smooth. If I just click once, I get a cusp. But if I click and drag out, I get the actual Bezier uh, tangent. I'll close it up there. There you go. Again, I am looking at the red, green, blue, but I'm outputting red, green, blue, alpha, okay? Now, with that all said and done, uh, we can go ahead and draw out some other shapes. So I'm gonna go ahead and come in here, and let's delete this one, and I'll draw out, say, a cusp bezier. That's just your typical hard case, no matter how hard I try to come in here and, you know, click and drag, it's not gonna allow me, it's just cusped, right? And again, at any time I can grab these points, Right-click them and say cusp D smooth. I'll just hit smooth Z. It gives me points that are smooth. And again, I can hold down control and drag out a feather if I want. If I want to remove that feather, we didn't forgot to mention this, you can say remove feather and then you just click and you've removed the feather itself so you don't have one. Be important to realize most of the time you want to be on select all. There are other options here such as select spline, select points, and select feather points. So for instance, 
If I did have a feather, I'll hold down, you know, come over here, hit select all, grab this point, drag out a couple feathers, right? I can go ahead and come over here and say select splines, right? And what that means is I'm going to go ahead and select splines, uh, which is the individual splines themselves. And then if I say select points, and I grab, you can see I'm only selecting the points themselves. I can actually scale them in like this. I'm only selecting points. So if I lasso grab anywhere, I'm just grabbing points. Select feather points would mean if I lasso grab, I'm just selecting the feather points, which is kind of useful. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these two guys. Let's go ahead and draw some other options here. So... There's Bezier. There's also a B spline. This is used. Um, it's sort of like a weird tangent from a normal's position. So you can see you could feather this out with this dash here. <clears throat> so it has an interesting shape based on the normal's direction from one end to the other. It's not necessarily two splines to animate. <clears throat> you also have ellipse, which you can go ahead and click and hold, and you get a circle. Now, if you want to click and hold and extend up from a position, like, for instance, if I come over here, you can hold down Shift, and it'll scale from the point you first drew. Whereas if you just come in here and click, it's not going to stay uniform. So if I click and click it out, it's going to stay uh, uniform scaled. But if I let go of Shift, I get this. Now, if I hold down Control, you can see it's going to scale it from the center point that I draw, as you can see here. So if I... Grab this, again, grab a ellipse, hold down control, centers from there. But if I just draw ellipse by itself, it scales from the point that I actually pull out. And then most of the time, you're going to hold down shift to restrain the, the aspect ratio to be one to one, as you can see. So I'll get rid of these ellipses. These are commonly used a lot. <clears throat> There's also a rectangle. I can go ahead and draw a rectangle. Now, this rectangle isn't, is, is, is still looks like it's cusped, but it actually has tangent curves on the points here. All right, so I went ahead and raced that one. And we're going to go ahead and jump over here to a uh, other final option, which is open spline. This is a relatively newcomer. And what this puppy does is it allows for either you can close it up or you can click and drag and just click out. And these are good for animating hair. So you can see I can extend this out like this and have this guy be really skinny like that. At any one point in time, you can say add points and skinny up the image. You have two little bars here. You have this green, which brings down the whole image, and then the purple, which actually gives you a feather, which is kind of nice. So these are for uh, creating hairs and so forth and so on. I want to talk about animating splines briefly inside of Nuke and why it is so much better than doing in, say, After Effects. If I create an ellipse here, you will see with this ellipse that I can come in here and animate it, right? So I have at one frame at 121, move it over here, 154, and then I move it up, right? So here I have this animation that goes up and down. And by the way, if you go under motion blur, you can actually turn on motion blur uh, just by coming in here and clicking on on. And now you can see we have a slight, if I hit Q to hide my options here, we have some motion blur. So I'll go ahead and turn that off for now. So that can be come in handy. But you can see if I animate this, this up and down, if I want to like adjust this so it's off to the left a little bit, you know, I'm going to have, if I look at my dope sheet, i got these keyframes here. What if I want to offset everything together? Well, that's where this really awesome tool here, and you can see when you see click on red, that means warning zone. Turn this thing off when you're done with it or else you're going to be in trouble. This is the ripple edit tool. What does this do? Well, at any one, any point in time, I'll just put it on this keyframe for, for instance, I can go ahead and offset this, right? So if I take this whole thing with the ripple edit tool and physically move it, it has offset the entire animation. Okay? See that? I usually like to do this on a single frame because if I do it where there's no actual keyframe, I'll, I'll move it over here and you can see it adds a key from which you know, the animation's fine, but it's just offset. Now, if I were to do that without this tool, which you want to turn off when you're done with it, um, you can see what happens. It adds a keyframe, and things just get goofy, right? 
But the beauty of the ripple edit tool is just find offsets. So for instance, and just do a quick offset, ripple edit tool, move it up here, turn it off. Okay, again, you can take your keyframes, move them around. You can see at different times. Grab these keyframes here, move it around. Beauty of Nuke is just the simplicity of such things. And also, for instance, what if you wanted to add a feather? Well, if I were to wanted to add a feather, right? Go ahead and add a feather, right? I want to have that for the entire duration of the scene, but it only, you know, animates out and comes back in, right? I'm going to undo that. And what I'm going to do here is come in here and actually play around with this by turning on my Ripple Edit tool and pulling out this. So now it has offset for all keys. This is extremely handy and say if you ever wanted to offset just one tangent a little bit, you can see it's basically changing that. The big key to remember is to turn this troublemaker off. It's a powerful tool, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility to use a cliche uh, line. But you definitely want to turn this thing off when you're done. There are other options to talk about from start to end and range, which allow you to create an offset from a specific point. So if I say from to from start, if I create an offset from here, I can go ahead and animate this down here. And now you can see the animation changes there, but not past this point. So it's a lot of something you can play around with and kind of get used to uh, throughout the whole process. But that's a basic introduction to this. Now, what does this, how do we use this roto node at all uh, for other things? Well, we can use it to do uh, such things as rotoscoping. So I can not commonly put this roto through my background of my character. I'm going to come in here and just do a quick roto on, eh, let's do my eye. I'm going to use a bezier. And I'm going to take advantage of these beziers. I'm going to pull them out, click and hold. And here's the beauty of the bezier while it's still being drawn out. As long as I have more than one point out, I can physically move it. I can drag these tangents or hold down control and break the tangent. And then I can keep continuing on. And zoom in really tight like this. Hold down uh, control on the tangents. The point is to draw as least amount of these as possible. If I draw out this one point, I can get a pretty good S-curve just by coming around. I'll come around the wrinkle in my eye like this. And what I do is I usually click, hold, and drag towards the direction that the curvature or parallel to the curvature of what I'm trying to roto. You can see the lines going this way. I'm dragging my mouse this way. Usually you can use a Wacom tablet, which is a common what artists use. And then I'll close her up like that. Just move this around. I can make just slight adjustments, and there you go. Now, I can actually use this information because by default, a roto node is set to output alpha. So if I hit A for alpha, you can see if I, you know, if I detach this background here, you can see it's, it's coming through as this, right? So what I can do is I can take this roto node, I can set it to output alpha pre-malt RGBA. This actually cuts the character out of it, A for alpha. You can see now I have this gigantic eyeball here <laughs> that's been cut out. I can feather the edge by coming in here and just feathering it a little bit, like that. And then I can also take this and merge it around my original. So I can go ahead and hit M for merge, and I will choose B for background, which is my original plate shot, A for top, which is my new piece here, and I'll put merge. And if I hit Q, you can see I've just put that piece on top. I can make give myself sort of a monster's look by adding a transform node just past this roto node here. And if I hit my Q for overlay, as you can see, my transform is set to the center of the framing. If I go ahead and stretch, it's going to move it around from there. With the transform node, you can hold down control and click the center of your transform node and move the center pivot point to right there. Okay, you can see it's changing our center X and Y. So from now, from here, I'm going to give myself a, a quasi-crazy eye here. And if we just see, it looks a little weird, right? If I grab the viewers, you can see my other eye. I look kind of freakish uh, and so forth. So it's a subtle thing. They've done this in horror movies before. If I need to come back to my roto node, I can feather this a little bit, such as like right here. Feather it back maybe or something. There we go. There we go. So there's a subtle craziness. 
We're going to get into tracking a little bit later, but you can see how you can start to use this. Usually you'll use it to cut out a character completely and put them with a character behind them, which is a whole art form in of itself. Now before we continue on with anything else, um, I want to talk about the Roto Paint tool. So I'll go ahead and plug in the Roto Paint here. That's directly plugged into our uh, read node. And you can see by default, the, the Roto Paint node is set to RGBA. Okay. I'm going to put my properties bin to 1 again, just so I can get one thing going on here. With my overlays on, again, I hit Q to turn them on. I'm going to come in here and do just some paint work. So by brush type, I can take brush, I can paint. You can see I've made a paintbrush here. And you have a little thing here, which is a little arrow to turn it off. One is to also lock it so you can't grab it. One is to actually click and turn the color. So if I want to actually give this a you know different color or something, I could give it a color. And you can see the lifespan is currently on the frame I drew, which is frame 76. If I were to jump off this frame, it goes away. Okay. Now, if I put this to all and draw out an actual curve, you can see it stays on all the way. If I want this actual uh, brush stroke to stay on forever, I click the brush stroke, go to lifetime, and there's this little thing you can pull down to say all frames, or use this little hotkey here, which is to which is basically says all frames. And now that will stay with us till the end. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these two brush strokes and keep going. We have an erase tool, so if you do brush something in there, you can erase it. Okay. Go ahead and get rid of this. And then there's also Cologne brush tool, which is if I hold down shift and drag out. You can see I need to define out the offset. So I'm going to go hold on control and drag it out. And you can see that whatever is set as my plus sign is what I'm grabbing from. So I can go ahead and clone, do some clone work. Again, this is, if I use my arrow keys, it's only on one frame. I could set this to all frames so that I have two nostrils playing through for the entire option here. Let's go ahead and make sure this is set to all. Go ahead and get rid of all these guys. Let's do the clone brush. Again, I'm going to set it to all. And now it's, you can see it's, it's moving along for all frames, which is really cool. All righty. So with that said, let's go ahead and touch upon the other goodies. We've got the reveal brush. Now, what is the reveal brush all about? Well, let's say I did a color correction job on this background. Let's say, uh, let's do a gray node, right? And I'll go ahead and plug that into here. And I'll get rid of all this other stuff so I don't have to look at it. Commonly in compositing, you want to go down and to the right. So I'm going to take the gray node, and let's give myself a evil leprechaun look, right? There we go. So I can actually plug in, if I put bring this down and get this arrow out of the way, I got this little option here called background one. I can plug in up, up to three backgrounds if I want to. But I have this set to inputting for background one. So if I put my viewer to Roto Paint, I'll get rid of this cologne brush here. I can come in here and uh, add a reveal. And I could say, what am I going to reveal? Well, if I, a lot of stuff is hidden here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and reveal a, I'm going to use all frames. And I'm going to reveal background one. So what does that mean? Well, if I paint, it's actually revealing whatever my input is for input one, right? You can see if I come back to my grade node, I can play with the color, so forth. So pretty cool, huh? All right, so finally, let's take a look at the other options here. There's a lot going on here, by the way. Um, any one of these tools has many different options. Uh, for instance, with the brush tool, you have the option of the hardness of the brush, which I usually grab my middle mouse scroll wheel and drag and hold and put this down to like a hardness of zero. You get a softness or you get a hard edge. And then also have you, you have size here. If you want to change the size of the brush, hold down shift and left mouse drag and make your brush bigger and smaller. Again, you can kind of see the realities. And then you have opacity. I could set this to 0.5. And now you can see we only have half opacity on here. Very much like Photoshop, like I mentioned before. And you also have compositing operations here. You can say difference. And you'll start to get like this negative option here. There's a lot of different things you can do uh, as far as painting on here. It's just pretty crazy. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of delete all this stuff so we get out of there. 
And then you got your typical stuff like blur, right? A lot of this can be used in taking out wrinkles. There's a whole beautician's uh, reality. And then there's sharpen, right? And then there's smear. This can be used for uh, such things as dealing with cloning out an alternative to cloning for skies. It's kind of usually uh, used for that. And then you have dodge and burn. So you can see it kind of creates this highlight color saturation. Burn, again, gets a little ins insane, so you can put the opacity down to, say, something like 0 0.09 and get a subtle effect. Well, not so subtle there. Put this down to, like, point value of 1 or something. So there you go. So that's pretty much it. I just want to let you guys understand what commonly is used in rotos and rotoscoping before we kind of close this up. I'm going to go ahead and take a tape of uh, roto here and plug it in. Or actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take a roto off the side, and I'm going to go ahead and do a grade note. So I'm going to hit G for grade. And let's say in this scene I want to oh, hmm, maybe brighten up this side of my face. So I'm going to go ahead and take this grade node. And I'm going to go ahead and take a gain and really brighten it up. So I'm going to put my viewer to the grade node. You can see the gain is starting to brighten up really nice, right? And also, maybe I want to sharpen my eye a little bit, okay? So I'm going to add a sharpen node. Put that to the viewer. And by default, the sharpen's pretty intense, but it does sharpen up my eyes. You can see how it gives you a black outline artifact. But hey, now what if I just want to do that for this area of my face? Well, I could use a roto node. So again, the roto node doesn't have to be attached to the read node. I'll just take the roto node, come in here, and I'll create a really quick, again, I'm not going along the edges of myself too much here. I'm just getting those nice areas of highlights or whatever. Usually I use keying for this way process too. Uh, it's commonly called qualifying if you're used to DaVinci Resolve. So with that said, I have this area here, and I can go ahead and plug in my mask input. So you got to move this down and get access to this little arrow and plug in mask. And then same thing with the sharpen, it's got a mask. So that, technically, if you hit Q, you can see we have a sharp fall off of this. So what I can do is grab the roto node with it selected, type tab, and hit BLU and write blur. And I will blur this. This is the common way people use roto nodes through blurs. They don't usually do that pre mold thing I showed you earlier. But you can see just by blurring that edge, I now have an image that if I grab these two nodes and hit D to disable, we have a, a nice punchier image, right? There's still a pretty sharp edge here. So if I go back to my roto node, I can complement my blur by holding down control and just dragging this out like this. Now, if this was animated, I would use my uh, ripple edit tool, obviously. That's going to transition everything a lot easier. So we get a nice transition there. So again, see how beautiful? This is just like working in DaVinci Resolve. It allows me to do a nice punch and sharpen up, you know, a, a bad focus job I did on the day. This can be used for many things, such as color correction, sharpening, adding different uh, things. Uh, commonly, rotos are used in key mixes. We'll be getting to that. But as of right now, this is ba the basics of understanding the Roto Node. I went through a lot, by the way. Um, like I said, there's a whole bunch of other crazy options in here that I didn't even talk about. Uh, for instance, the whole idea of, I'll go ahead and show you this. This is really cool. I'll leave, this, I'll leave you with this because I'm so excited. So, for instance, if you use something like a clone job, right, and say I clone my eye, right, so I'll go ahead and offset this offset this. I can clone this, but I can actually come in here, this little cog mechanic wheel here, and I can say maybe rotate 20 degrees. So you can see now my eye is rotated 20 degrees. Okay, I can put that back to zero. I can do a scale so it scales twice as big. Kind of zoom up. You can see it's the eye is twice as big now through the clone job. There's also skew, which you hardly ever use. Um, and there's also, I believe that's it pretty much. So I hope you have some fun there. Play around with the Rotonode, get used to it. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about unpremultiplication and premultiplication and how it affects your images.